So just by way of introduction, so for those who don't know me, my name is Mark Shackleton. I'm the clinical lead of the MPCCC's Precision Oncology Program, which is now kind of, I think, running into its third or fourth year or something. Um, and uh, and uh, just uh, just about to be um, um, refunded, which we're which we're really excited about. So expecting it to continue and grow for at least the next four years, um, based on the um, um, promised tenure of funding, which is exciting. So my other hat is as a director of oncology um, at the Alfred Hospital. I'd like to open today's seminar first by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're joining from today. Um, and respectively acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, as well as any members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community that are gathered uh, amongst us this afternoon. So uh, again, by way of brief background, the Precision Oncology Program is, is a community of um, researchers and health professionals and academics uh, across Victoria uh, that have an, a, a, an interest uh, in the application of uh, precision medicine uh, to cancer patients. Uh, we're currently working to establish uh, better access to molecular sequencing for patients, particularly in areas of the state uh, that are traditionally less well served by such access. And uh, we also um, sponsor a, a, an ever increasing number uh, of uh, molecular tumour boards that serve to support uh, clinicians and, ref and, and referring other referrers uh, to uh, 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 around the interpretation um, of data derived from their sequencing uh, towards making recommendations for the care uh, of individual patients. So please uh, log in to find out more, particularly about the molecular tumour board processes. Um, they're really fantastic for, uh, uh, for engagement uh, across, uh, uh, across our community, both, uh, both educational benefits as well as actual direct benefits for our patients, including by way of referral to particular clinical trials. So these seminars are, are an important part of the overall precision oncology program and have uh, I think been you know, really spectacularly well attended um, over the last couple of years. Uh, and they obviously help to uh, provide a forum for us to share uh, activity um, and, and, and the latest research information um, across our partnership. And today um, we're just super excited to welcome, welcome Felix uh, Feng, uh, who's the George and Judy Marcus Distinguished Professor of Radiation Oncology Urology and Medicine, um, and also the Vice Chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology um, at, uh, at uh, uh, UCSF. Felix, you really got to come up with some sort of acronym, I think, to help uh, help us get through all of your titles. Um, it's a very impressive, um, um, impressive array of responsibilities. Um, he's Because he's also the, the Executive Director of the Benioff uh, Initiative for Prostate Cancer Research, um, also based at UCSF, which is uh, focused on uh, translational research uh, in prostate cancer um, and also has um, a very tr uh, prominent role um, as a director of translational research uh, in the Diller Family uh, Comprehensive Cancer Centre. Um, there's other things that he does as well and I don't think I'll keep going. Uh, it's a very long list. So we're really, really just super excited um, to have you talk uh, today. Felix is one of the real, um, real world leading, um, uh, one of the real thought leaders um, in, in this disease and looking forward to hearing your talk, which is uh, uh, advertised as optimised um, um, uh, methyl, uh, methylation sequencing um, of ctDNA as a biomarker for response in prostate cancer. Over to you, uh, Felix. We really look forward to your talk. Uh, Mark, thank you uh, so much for that uh, generous introduction. Um, sorry, everyone, that uh, my system decided to reboot. Uh, hopefully, you guys can see my screen at this point in time. Um, and it's always wonderful to see uh, familiar faces. I see that, you know, Renee and uh, Lisa are, are, are here and I would love to see you guys in person, but you know, I think this is the next best thing. Um, and again, thank you uh, for the invitation to speak today. Um, and, and so as Mark mentioned today, I'm going to be talking about optimized 5-hydroxymethyl uh, cytosine sequencing of ctDNA as a biomarker of response uh, in metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and Mark, before I go on, uh, uh, how long uh, do I have to speak and how much time do you want to save for questions? Uh, I, I, I can adjust based on the fact that I lost a couple minutes up front. Yeah, so I mean, most talks run for between 40 and 45 minutes with some discussion at the end. But, you know, if you've got, if you want to run over to 50 or something like that, that would be absolutely fine. So. Oh, no, it's okay. I mean, I, I'll finish within that, that time period. Not a problem. Um, okay, so... Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, I serve on the Scientific Advisory Board for Blue Star Genomics, which is a company that does do 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing uh, 
um, and that's the relevant disclosure today. So be before continuing further, I just want to provide a brief overview uh, of um, uh, you know, the clinical course of progression uh, for a patient with aggressive prostate cancer. And so uh, as many of you may know, when a patient, the, the, this, is a curve, this is a graph and the PSA levels uh, are shown on the y-axis and they in indicate, uh, rising PSAs indicate more aggressive prostate cancer. So in the course of a prostate cancer patient's disease, uh, he may be diagnosed with the disease at a lower PSA. Uh, the PSA rises, prompting treatment with surgery or radiation. Uh, and the vast majority of the time, surgery or radiation is a curative process. Um, but there are uh, a, a subset of patients who develop recurrence after surgery or radiation, and their disease progresses. They're initiated on first-line androgen deprivation therapy. Um, that actually suppresses PSA and keeps the disease at bay, usually for many, many years. Um, but again, some of these patients will develop resistance to androgen deprivation therapy, and they subsequently, uh, prog their disease progresses uh, into kind of the metastatic uh, niche. Um, and at that point in time, they're in initiated on a variety of different agents, second line, third line, fourth line uh, agents, and their disease is termed metastatic castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer. And one thing is clear is that there's actually um, a critical need to develop biomarkers of response to systemic therapies uh, with patients, uh, uh, for patients with advanced prostate cancer. Currently, our paradigm actually includes trying one therapy. If it doesn't work, moving to another therapy. If that doesn't work, moving to another therapy. And I think the ultimate goal is to try to have a better idea upfront of who benefits from what therapies. Um, and so today, I'm going to split my talk into two parts. And the first part is uh, going to describe what we have learned so far uh, from biomarker studies in metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And for that, I'm going to emphasize five key points, uh, which we'll go over. And for the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the potential of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing as a liquid biomarker in uh, metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer patients. But I think that the, um, the, this technology and the themes that I go over can be actually applied to many different uh, disease spaces as well. Um, and so, okay, starting with the five key points about uh, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And so point number one is that biopsies are not routinely obtained uh, in patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So non-invasive biomarkers are needed. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can actually point to our institutional effort. Um, and so seven years ago, we started an international multi-institutional effort to obtain metastatic biopsies from patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And my uh, colleague and, and, and friend, Eric Small, led an effort funded by the uh, Stamp to Cancer Organization and the Prostate Cancer Foundation to uh, biopsy, obtain metastatic biopsies on hundreds uh, of uh, MCRPC patients. And, and as a consequence, we now have one of the largest biorepositories of um, MCRPC samples from the actual metastases uh, and we have over 400 uh, unique patient samples. However, during that same period, the institutions that were involved in this effort treated you know, about 8,000 patients, and we were trying to biopsy as many patients as possible, and we got to 400 known. So what that means is that if we, can, if we perform metastatic uh, biopsies on one out of every 20 patients that we treat, and we're actually actively trying to biopsy these patients, uh, it means that in real life practice, uh, metastatic biopsies are not that practical, and we can understand why, because sticking a needle in a patient's bone or liver, et cetera, um, is not uh, uh, the easiest thing to do, particularly when you have PSA levels that kind of indicate in many patients who's doing well with therapy and who needs more aggressive therapy. So point one is we actually don't get that many metastatic biopsies despite how much we want to. Point number two is that a non-invasive biomarker assay uh, is... Um, uh, now approved to select patients uh, uh, with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer for treatment with PARP inhibitors. And so this is data from the Triton 2 study that was Sima Beta uh, published in JCO uh, last year. And this basically was a study um, uh, of MCRPC patients with BRCA1 or 2 mutations treated with recaparib. And I, you know, I, again, you can see here the waterfall plot, there's a nice response, but I think the most important point for today's talk is that the foundation one liquid companion diagnostic assay, which is a targeted sequencing assay for CTDNA, was approved by the FDA as a companion diagnostic for selecting these MCRPC patients 
uh, with BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations for treatment with brucaparib. And so these liquid biomarkers are now used for patient selection, and I think that's a key point. So point number three I want to make is that plasma ctDNA sequencing can capture the heterogeneity of disease, and in particular, the heterogeneity of treatment resistance in MCRPC patients. And so this was a study that uh, David Quigley, uh, who was a um, fellow research fellow of my group and now has his own laboratory, uh, he and I actually led in, in, in published in Cancer Discovery a couple years back. And what we did was we biopsied patients before the initiation of treatment and at the time of the development of treatment resistance, and we biopsied their metastases. Um, and so this is an example of a patient who uh, had MCRPC, uh, uh, was treated with the PARP inhibitor talazoparib, uh, had a wonderful response, and that, that response actually lasted about um, uh, close to six months, uh, and then started progressing again. And again, we got biopsies both before and after. And what we were looking for was something called a reversion mutation. And just to give you a, a brief summary of what this is, uh, in a, uh, a patient with a BRCA2 mutation, their normal cells harbor one uh, um, functional co uh, copy of BRCA2, but they also have a germline pathogenic uh, uh, copy of BRCA2 where there's usually, let's say, um, a mutation that leads to truncation of the protein and so forth. Um, if you actually look at their, and so the, in the normal cells, they have one normal copy and one pathogenic copy. Um, if you look at the patient's metastasis, what happens is they usually have loss of heterozygosity where they lose the functional allele and are left with the non-functional pathogenic allele. What has been described, at least from biopsies of patient samples, is that they can develop something called a reversion mutation uh, at the time of resistance to PARP inhibitor, where they get a deletion that basically deletes out the pathogenic uh, uh, part of the, the, the pathogenic mutation. And what that does is that actually restores BRCA2 function because now uh, this truncating mutation is no, lo no longer present. Everything is usually shifted back into frame. And this results in a functional uh, in-frame BRCA2 protein that's a bit smaller than normal, but somehow functional. And so we went hunting for reversion mutations and we found them. And so this is the sample from our patient where we have a, uh, this is the patient's germline. And what you can see here is that um, there's a, about a 50% distribution of the pathogenic uh, BRCA2 mutation shown in yellow. Uh, the wild type is shown in blue. Now, in the metastatic samples, what you see is an enrichment uh, for the pathogenic mutation shown in yellow over the wild type allele BRCA2, or BRCA, wild type copy shown in blue. Um, and again, this is just because uh, there's loss of BRCA2 and you still have some wild type because there's some stroma uh, in there probably with, uh, 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 with normal BRCA2. Now, at the time of resistance to PARP inhibitors, what I want you to see is that there's actually, you see this drop in, in the coverage map consistent with potentially a deletion through the space. But now you basically see that this deletion spans the pathogenic uh, uh, mutation. And now um, the, the relative uh, uh, frequency of that pathogenic mutation in the sample uh, is dropped down. And what that basically means is that um, uh, something is wiping out that pathogenic mutation consistent with this deletion mutation. Um, and this is in patients, uh, actual patient metastatic samples. But when you look at the ctDNA samples from that same patient, now you can see that it, while, while in the tumor sample, we found two different deletions uh, in the ctDNA, we see in this particular patient, seven different deletions, all uh, kind of spanning the pathogenic mutation and all putting BRCA2 back into frame. And, and so what this suggests is that um, perhaps there's, you know, uh, let's say for simple, for, to simplify, let's just say that there are seven different uh, clones uh, that have developed PARP inhibitor resistance in this patient. They all had a different reversion uh, deletion that all puts BRCA2 back in frame. Um, and each metastasis may only harbor one or two of these clones, uh, but that the ctDNA can capture the spectrum of heterogeneity of this resistance mechanism. Um, and, you know, here's data actually from another patient, a uh, similar um, uh, story, you know, response, initial response to PARP inhibitor, then developed resistance. We biopsied at the time of resistance. And in this particular patient, now you can see that there were 34 different reversion mutations um, in that uh, plasma sample from that patient. Again, 
Uh, and what this suggests is that uh, CT DNA analysis can capture that heterogeneity. It's actually somewhat sobering, but uh, you know that a, a single resistance mechanism uh, um, is selected for so strongly, and that this resistance mechanism can take 34 different specific forms uh, in the same patient. Now, so I, I've taught you, I, I, I've showed you so far that you know, number one, we don't biopsy patients. Um, uh, that number two, uh, uh, liquid biopsies are coming, and number three, that the liquid biopsies can capture heterogeneity. The fourth point I want to bring up is that while the majority of uh, liquid biopsy approaches actually look at the coding genome, the alterations in the non-coding genome are also important and can also confer treatment resistance in patients with metastatic castro-resistant prostate cancer. And so it's widely known that the androgen receptor is amplified uh, in patients with metastatic prostate cancer. And so here you can see chromosome X, uh, and there's always been an amplification peak around the region of the androgen receptor. It was always thought that this represented amplification of the AR gene body, which you see here. And yes, indeed, the AR gene body is amplified, let's say in 70% of cases, but it turns out that there is actually a um, amplification peak upstream of the androgen receptor gene body uh, that is actually amplified in 80% of metastatic castro resistant prostate cancers. Um, and it turns out that this area corresponds to an enhancer of AR, and that when you have either amplification of the AR gene body or the AR enhancer or, or both, um, either of these amplifications is sufficient to drive overexpression of AR itself. And I can go in the mechanism of this and, and so forth, uh, but I think what I just wanted to point out is we might be missing uh, important biomarkers if we're only looking for alterations involving protein coding genes. And so we want a genome-wide approach if we can. Um, and my colleague, Chris Maher, published this paper uh, uh, last year showing that you can detect uh, these enhancer amplifications uh, in ctDNA and that patients with either a uh, amplification of the AR gene body or the AR uh, enhancer um, actually have poor prognoses uh, in patients subsequently treated um, with androgen signaling inhibitors. Uh, and so again, you know, non-coding alterations may be important um, and that, you know, you know, we should think about them uh, when we're looking for biomarkers. And so the fifth and final point that I want to make here is that the genomic landscape of metastatic castro-resistant prostate cancer is not as active in, in uh, MCRPC compared to other solid tumors. Um, and so, um, and, and here what you can see is kind of the mutational prevalence across a, a wide range of different cancers. You know, and prostate cancer is a bit on the lower side, especially when you're looking at solid tumors. Um, uh, and, and, and so what that suggests is, you know, maybe in addition to looking at the genome, we should be looking at some other components, like for example, the epigenome when we're looking for biomarkers. And so I'm just going to lay out these five key points, and you know they, you know I think that when I go on and talk about five hydroxymethylcytosine, you'll see why I'm bringing them up. And so point number one is tissue biopsies of metastasis of patients with castrate resistant prostate cancer are not frequently obtained, so we should think about liquid biopsies. Number two, non-invasive liquid biopsies are now FDA approved at least for selection of patients for PARP inhibitors. Uh, number three, ctDNA captures uh, the heterogeneity of cancers in patients with MCRPC. Number four, we should think about a genome-wide discovery approach that actually captures coding as well as non-coding genes. Um, and number five, perhaps we should look beyond just pure genomic approaches and we should look at, let's say, the epigenome or other aspects of, uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, the genomic axis. Um, and so where I'm, where, I'm, where, where I'm trying to lead you with this is that I believe that 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing um, can address all these points, and it's a ctDNA-based epigenomic approach for surveying the entire genome uh, for gene activation. Um, so before I go on any further, I just want to make sure I haven't dropped off the Wi-Fi. You guys can still hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, we can. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, you know, after uh, the episode earlier this hour, I'm afraid I'm just talking to myself for an hour. Um, so. I'm going to now proceed to the second part of my talk, which is talking about the potential of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, which I'm going to abbreviate 5-HMC, uh, as a sequencing approach uh, for looking at liquid biomarkers uh, in patients with MC, metastatic cash resistant prostate cancer. And so um, 
I, I want to kind of briefly discuss how we got to 5-HMC as a sequencing approach. And so I had mentioned that my colleague, Eric Small, uh, had initiated a very large uh, biopsy program at UCSF. Uh, and now we biopsied over 400 metastasis from over 400 patients. Um, and what we've done is we basically try to layer on a number of different uh, genomic sequencing approaches uh, onto the same um, tumor metastases. Um, and so we published our results on kind of delineating the whole genome landscape of metastatic prostate cancer a number of years ago. We followed that up last year with uh, kind of laying the landscape of, uh, of methylation alterations by conventional whole genome bisulfide sequencing. In the process, we became interested in 5-hydroxymethylcytosine sequencing, and I'll explain what that is in the subsequent slide. But we've also uh, done ATAC sequencing, high c sequencing. We've done transcriptome sequencing down to uh, up, uh, up to close to a billion reads per sample. Um, and we've also collected ctDNA analysis uh, from the same patients and done a targeted conventional sequencing approach. And that was led by Alex Wyatt from the University of British Columbia. Um, but now we have a very rich genomics biorepository uh, of metastases where we can kind of do a lot of integrative analyses across these different sequencing approaches. And our goal has been really to create resources for the cancer research community. However, you know, um, you know we're also interested in biomarkers. And so Alex and his team basically uh, showed um, nice kind of ctDNA sequencing just with a targeted exome. Uh, uh, um, platform a couple of years ago. Um, uh, but we've really been thinking about, okay, we have all this data from the metastasis. We have some limited ctDNA samples. What is the best biomarker platform? And we ended up arriving at 5-HMC as probably, of, of all these different approaches, probably the best, best way to kind of derive biomarkers from ctDNA. And I'll tell you why in subsequent slides. But before I move on, I have to tell you what 5-hydroxymethylcytosine uh, uh, sequencing is, okay? Um, and so when we uh, uh, usually talk about DNA methylation, we're basically referring to the addition of a methyl group, as you can see here in red, uh, to the base cytosine. And what that does is that results that in that cytosine becoming a 5-methyl cytosine or 5-MC uh, moiety. Um, now, the absence of methylation is uh, associated with open chromatin and uh, active gene expression. Um, when cytosine gets methylated, this results in uh, closure of the chromatin, kind of closed chromatin states, uh, and repression uh, of gene expression. So basically, uh, turning off of, uh, of, uh, of genes. But it turns out that the TET family of enzymes actually um, will, uh, re are responsible for hydroxylating uh, a 5-methylcytosine. And what that does is this creates a 5-hydroxymethylcytosine group or 5-HMC. And that many, many different groups have shown that 5-HMC is actually associated with gene activation. Um, and it's postulated that this is a step in uh, demethylation. And so when the methyl group on 5-methylcytosine is you know, potentially going to get removed, it gets hydroxylated, and, and this is an intermediate step before the entire methyl group takes uh, is removed. And what that does is potentially this is why 5-hydroxymethylcytosine is a surrogate of gene activation, because removal of a methylation group means uh, um, removal of the repressing um, uh, methyl group uh, which equals gene activation. And so when we think about methylation, you know, we've been trained to think that it's associated with repression of gene expression, but that's only true for 5-methylcytosine groups and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, which actually probably represents, represents only 5% of all methylation, is actually associated with gene activation. Um, and so we have built an optimized, what well, we've actually, we actually started doing 5-HMC ourselves in our own lab but we recognized that you know, we wanted to partner with a company that actually had a clinical grade uh, uh, approach in a, in a CLIA lab. Uh, and so we partnered with this company called Blue Star Genomics. And Blue Star has basically optimized a chemical reaction that specifically adds biotin to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine moieties on DNA. And this is their secret sauce of sorts. And after this is done, the rest of this is actually somewhat easy. You can pull down that biotin with streptavidin beads. You can PCR amplify the fragments that are DNA fragments that are pulled down. Um, and you know what this does is this basically results in amplification of, of the stretches of DNA where there's 5-HMC 
and and the, you know the kind of in this in the data if you're ever interested it looks like kind of chip seek data so you kind of get peaks building up uh, in the areas of 5-HMC. What's kind of cool about this is that in addition to being in a clinical grade lab, it requires only five to 10 nanograms of input DNA. So it's actually relatively low uh, input, which is important for a biomarker strategy. And so, um, um, and, and, and kind of part of the reason we were so interested in this is that we've recognized that RNA expression, uh, you know, at least in prostate cancer, May represent may yield a, a you know a lot of important biomarkers, um, and, and actually may have more potential than pure DNA based biomarkers for looking at certain biological processes. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out a way to infer RNA expression from circulating tumor DNA, and we think 5-hydroxymethylcytosine is the way to do this. And I'll kind of show you more. But we basically decided to try to address two main research questions, and the first is. What is the landscape of 5-HMC marks in metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer samples? And the second is, can 5-HMC be used as a blood-based biomarker of outcome uh, in patients? And so, um, you know, the first thing we did was we, uh, you know, performed, you know, genome-wide 5-HMC sequencing of prostate cancer metastases, so the actual metastatic samples themselves. Um, and in the same samples, we had performed standard whole genome bisulfide sequencing we had performed our uh, transcriptome sequencing and we had performed whole genome sequencing. And what this did was this, uh, look, this allowed us to look at, you know, where 5-HMC is enriched across the genome and, and how it's associated with active transcription. And so when you look at standard 5-methylcytosine, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, again, this represents 95% of all uh, methylation, what you're interested in is hypomethylation, so loss of uh, 5-MC uh, is important because that's associated with gene activation. When you look for 5-HMC, you look for the presence of 5-HMC. And what we decided to do was compare hypomethylation of 5-MC with enrichment of 5-HMC, just to see how the pattern differed. And what you can see is that 5-HMC enrichment occurs much more in gene bodies compared to uh, 5-MC hypomethylation, which actually is more enriched in promoters compared to 5-HMC. Um, and this is data from, again, 100 metastases. And what you can see here is this is a way of representing genome-wide data. Uh, and so this data is uh, uh, from every gene in the genome kind of scaled uh, along the same uh, x-axis. So now uh, we basically put the transcriptional start sites and the transcriptional end sites for every gene roughly in the same uh, location. Um, and what we wanted to see was where 5-HMC is occurring uh, throughout this gene. And what we've done here is we've broken, broken down all the genes in the genome into five quintiles, okay? Um, quintile number five, shown in purple, uh, is the top 20% of genes with the highest uh, absolute levels of RNA expression. Quintile one is the, uh, the bottom quintile based on RNA expression. Um, and then on the y-axis, what you can see here is the uh, amount of 5-HMC, uh, you know, as a function of these quintiles. Um, and then uh, on the x-axis, again, you can see the transcriptional start site and the transcriptional end site. And what you can see is that, uh, number one, the genes that are most highly expressed as assessed by RNA expression, shown in purple, also have the highest amount of 5-HMC. Um, and, 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 and kind of the, the converse is true, that the genes that have the lowest RNA expression also have the lowest amount of 5-HMC shown in yellow. But what you can also see is that when you're looking for kind of the dynamic range of, you know, where 5-HMC um, is most sensitive at kind of uh, the differentiating gene expression, it's in the gene body. It's, it's largely between the transcriptional start site and the transcriptional end site. And that differs from, you know, how we think about looking at standard from uh, uh, 5-MC, which is kind of loss of methylation in the promoter area. So again, gene bodies are important for 5-HMC. So the second thing we wanted to see is how good is 5-HMC at predicting gene expression? And, and so this again represents another genome-wide analysis where we try to correlate um, a variety of different things with gene expression um, as, express, uh, as measured by RNA levels. And what you can see here is that uh, pink represents the correlation between promoter methylation, again, what's kind of standard 5-MC, five, standard five not standard, not 5-HMC, but standard 5-MC. Uh, green represents the correlation between copy number alter gain uh, and, and gene expression. 
and uh, um, blue represents the correlation between 5-HMC uh, in the gene bodies uh, and, and gene expression. And I think the big take-home point here is that uh, 5-HMC is most strongly correlated with gene expression compared to these other genomic or epigenomic approaches. Um, and you can see this basically on the correlation scores on the x-axis. And what we then did was we tried to build models to predict gene expression, okay? And in these models, we accounted for a copy number, which is abbreviated CN, PM, which stands for promoter methylation, SN, SNVs, uh, single nucleotide variants, and also SV, which stands for structural variations. And, um, and then 5-HMC um, uh, is shown in blue. And so the gray plots represents how well all these other uh, types of genomic or epigenomic uh, um, measurements when we build the, when we optimize a, a, a model to predict gene expression, how well they actually do. Um, and, the, and the blue bar represents what happens when you add 5-HMC on top of these other parameters. And, you know, for, in all these cases, uh, adding 5-HMC improves the prediction of gene expression. And on the left, you can see this is true for all genes. Uh, the second set of bars, uh, this is true for protein coding genes. The third set of bars, this is true for prostate cancer specific genes. And the fourth set of bars, this is true for androgen receptor response genes, which are, uh, of course, particularly important in the context of prostate cancer. So 5-HMC really helps predict gene expression. Now, another thing we did was basically look at um, what 5-HMC in particular is good at predicting in terms of gene expression. And so when you do a GSEA for the strength of correlation between 5-HMC uh, uh, levels and RNA expression, um, and you basically look at this as a function of cancer hallmark pathways, you see that the androgen response pathway has the strongest correlation uh, between 5-HMC and RNA expression levels. And we can break this down kind of into greater granularity. Um, this is a volcano plot basically showing the correlation between 5-HMC levels uh, and um, kind of prediction of RNA uh, expression levels for, uh, on, on the y-axis. And each of these dots represents data for a different gene. And the vast majority of genes you can see are encapsulated in this yellow area. Um, but I've also marked down kind of with black dots, AR response genes. And I think the point here is that AR response genes, you can see re relative to the general population are shifted to the far right. And what this means is that, you know, even on a gene by gene basis, 5-HMC is really uh, strongly predicting for expression of, uh, of androgen uh, AR response genes. Now we can actually go to some of our favorite genes of interest and actually show that 5-HMC uh, kind of corresponds to gain of oncogene activity in metastatic cashew resistant prostate cancer. And so for example, here what you can see is um, AR gene expression uh, measured by RNA expression levels uh, and then also AR 5-HMC levels. Um, and what you can see is that when there's amplification of AR, obviously AR, uh, the RNA expression of AR is higher, but also when you have AR amplification, 5-HMC is higher. You can see these same correlations with other genes. Um, when you have MYC amplification, of course, MYC RNA expression goes up, but also MYC 5-HMC levels also go up. Um, same is true for ERG uh, RNA expression and ERG 5-HMC levels as a function of having an ERG gene fusion or no ERG gene fusion. And, before I go on any further, I have to acknowledge that this 5-HMC project is being led by Martin Schostrom, who's a phenomenal postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Um, at the same time, 5-HMC also marks out uh, tumor suppressor genes in MCRPC uh, 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 tissues. And so here you can see BRCA2 gene expression uh, as a function of uh, um, no, no loss, one copy loss, two copy loss. Um, and you can see again that when you're looking at 5-HMC compared to RNA expression across all these tumor suppressors, uh, when you have loss of the tumor suppressor, you get decreased 5-HMC levels, trooper, and RB, P10, et cetera. You can also take 5-HMC data and just basically do unsupervised clustering and see what clusters out. And we had, we had uh, uh, um, done 5-HMC sequencing on 100 metastasis, about 54 localized prostate cancers, a couple of benign prostate samples, and then the green is um, uh, uh, adjacent benign tissue from bone or liver uh, in the context of uh, samples in which we have uh, obtained metastatic prostate cancer biopsies as well. And, and you can see broadly that benign tissues clustered out differently from localized tissue with 
you know, maybe one exception here, but that localized prostate cancer really clusters out from metastatic uh, prostate cancer as well. And so what we did was we did a differential 5-HMC analysis uh, comparing metastatic CRPC versus localized prostate cancer. And we mapped this out in a genome-wide basis. And so in this plot, uh, every chromosome is represented on the x-axis. Uh, the y-axis represents the, the location within that particular chromosome. The red bars area, indicate areas of the genome that have much higher 5-HMC levels in metastasis compared to localized. Blue is basically the reverse. And what you can see is that some of our favorite uh, oncogenes, uh, AR, FOXA1, uh, MYC, uh, are marked by uh, increases in um, uh, 5 HMC levels in metastasis compared to localized prostate cancer. And RB, a uh, tumor suppressor, uh, is uh, associated with decreased uh, uh, 5 HMC levels in metastasis compared to localized disease. And I want to point out that uh, Dr. Hansen He from the University of Toronto actually gave us the localized prostate cancer samples to which we compared. There are some other uh, interesting findings if you do kind of uh, genome-wide analyses or you do unsupervised clustering in this particular case. And so um, we took all our uh, uh, samples, um, metastatic prostate cancer samples, uh, and basically did unsupervised clustering based on the 5-HMC. And on the top, you can see that we ended up with three different clusters. What's fascinating is that the first cluster was all patients with small cell neuroendocrine histology. Um, and, and these patients are relatively enriched in P53RB alterations. The third cluster uh, is basically highly enriched for a hypermethylated subtype of prostate, uh, of metastatic prostate cancer that we had uh, uh, described in our Nature Genetics paper using kind of con conventional whole genome bisulfide sequencing. And so here, when we cluster, you get a small cell cluster and you get pretty much a hypermethylated cluster um, uh, and, I, and I think it's interesting that, you know, these patterns emerge. Um, and I could spend a lot of time talking about these different clusters, but I think it's important just to point out that these clusters exist. Um, but again, this is more of a biomarker talk. So where I want to lead you is that um, you can measure 5-HMC and ctDNA. And so the data I've shown you so far has been in metastatic tumor samples uh, from the metastases themselves. But now I'm going to start switching to what happens when you look at ctDNA. And so... Um, the first thing you can find is that there is concordance between 5-HMC levels in metastatic samples and uh, biopsies and the ctDNA uh, samples from the same patients, um, but that it varies a bit depending on what you're looking at. And so it turns out that <clears throat> the prostate cancer-specific genes shown here in green have the most concordance between um, the metastatic biopsy and the ctDNA. AR response genes, which are also relatively prostate-specific, also have high concordance and therefore can be marked out in, in ctDNA. All protein coding genes, genes is shown here in red. There is still some, actually a reasonable correlation, um, but it's not as strong as for prostate cancer specific or AR response genes. Now, when we start thinking about ctDNA, I, I wanna point out that, you know, there are many different sources of ctDNA in plasma. We like to think about uh, circulating tumor DNA, but the, uh, I wanna point out that normal cells such as leukocytes also contribute some DNA uh, into cell-free DNA. Um, and so just the amount of tumor DNA has been shown to be prognostic. And so the first thing we did was we actually used uh, our 5-HMC data to develop a classifier uh, of the total amount of circling tumor DNA. And we find that when you look at, uh, you know, um, uh, prostate cancer ctDNA content um, as a function of 5-HMC levels, you can see that having higher amounts of uh, circulating tumor DNA is associated with poor outcomes uh, compared to patients with you know, lower or medium amounts of ctDNA. And this is nothing new, by the way, but this was just the, the point that you can de detect so total ctDNA content with 5-HMC. And this cohort was 64 patients with metastatic castro-resistant prostate cancer who were subsequently treated with first-line androgen receptor signaling inhibitors such as abiraterone and enzalutamide, so kind of a standard um, population. And this this, this data was pro provided by Alex Wyatt from UBC. Um, but it turns out that in addition to just looking at total tumor DNA content, 5-HMC can also infer the activity of specific oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes uh, in cell-free DNA. Um, and so we took five of the most commonly altered oncogenes uh, in metastatic prostate cancer as shown here and five of the most common uh, tumor suppressor genes um, and what we did was we just actually 
score uh, each sample by the number of alterations in these oncogenes and tumor suppressor uh, uh, genes. And very simply put, the more uh, alterations you have as measured by uh, aberrancies and 5-HMC levels, the poorer the outcome. Uh, and so if you have you know, um, uh, either uh, high levels of these oncogenes uh, or low levels of the tumor suppressor genes by 5-HMC, um, if you have, let's say, five plus of these alterations, you have the poorest outcome. If you don't have any of these alterations, there's the best outcome. But I think the key point to bring up is that these p-values are p-values we obtained when adjusting for total ctDNA content, as I showed you in the earlier slide. And, and so when you have a liquid biomarker, especially one that focuses on ctDNA, you need to beat total ctDNA content, total tumor uh, DNA content. And so what this, these curves show and these adjusted p-values show is that even when you account for ctDNA con content, uh, the number of alterations of these genes uh, is quite prognostic. And so what this suggests is that, you know, what we're looking at is perhaps biologically relevant more in addition to just uh, beyond just how much tumor is there. Um, and the other thing we did was we actually just compared uh, our 5-HMC uh, sequencing of ctDNA with just a conventional targeted uh, uh, ctDNA panel uh, looking at, you know, uh, mutations and copy number gain and, and, and so forth. And what you can see is that, um, again, uh, this is overall survival kaplan meier curves based on conventional targeted uh, ctDNA sequencing. So like, for example, a comparable to a foundation medicine platform. This is actually Alex Wyatt's platform. When you perform standard ctDNA sequencing, you can see that um, you know, AR uh, um, alterations are associated with poor outcome uh, you know, in these patients who are treated with androgen receptor signaling inhibitors. You know, uh, MYC alterations associated with poor outcomes, RV loss associated with poor outcomes. But when you perform the same analysis looking for alterations based on 5-HMC levels, you see the same findings for AR, for MYC, and for RB1. And so I think you can infer common ev events from targeted ctDNA sequencing uh, based on 5-HMC as well. Now, you know, if 5-HMC, you know, if I tell you that 5-HMC uh, basically um, can be used to approximate standard ctDNA sequencing panels, well, that's fine, but that by itself is not of that much interest because you can say, well, we can just run a conventional ctDNA panel. The, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, standard targeted ctDNA uh, sequencing panels only include genes that are commonly genomically altered. So for example, what I showed you with AR or P53 or RB, but there are a lot of genes that are associated with poor outcomes in prostate cancer that are not genomically altered, meaning that there's, there's no copy, uh, uh, copy gain, copy loss, there's no mutations. Uh, and they're not included in ctDNA panels because why would you include them if there's no genomic alterations? And an example of this is TOP2A and EZH2. And so we reported, uh, uh, this is a study from Lee Ellis that we, we helped him uh, uh, out with, but he, he basically is so that, uh, demonstrated that uh, RNA expression of TOP2A and EZH2 is uh, associated with poor outcomes in prostate cancer. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that TOP2A and EZH2 are not genomically altered in metastatic prostate cancer, so they're not included in conventional ctDNA panels. Um, but, you know, you can infer RNA expression of TOP2A and EZH2 from 5-HMC sequencing. And so what you can see here is that in our patient cohort, you know, having either uh, high 5-HMC levels of TOP2A or EZH2 was associated with poor outcomes and having both was even associated with poor outcomes. And I think that this particular plot indicates the, the real potential of 5-HMC uh, in that now you can basically infer alterations in RNA expression from ctDNA and you can look at genes that may not have mutations or amplifications but are associated with poor outcomes based on RNA expression levels. And so uh, this is my last slide. Uh, number one, 5-HMC sequencing identifies gene action activation in metastatic cancer-resistant prostate cancer. And, and uh, number two, it adds uh, independent information uh, uh, of gene expression levels. Number three, 5-HMC in cell-free DNA can track the amount of prostate cancer based on ctDNA content. It can infer the activity of key oncogenes and tumor suppressors and show that these are prognostic, even independent of ctDNA content. Uh, it's a genome-wide assay uh, and it confer the activity of things like TOP2A and EZH2 
um, identifying aggressive subgroups that may not be identified with other approaches. Um, and you know, currently we're uh, you know uh, trying to optimize and validate these results in in, in larger cohorts. Uh, you know, potentially in some of the uh, um, clinical trials out of the ANZIP group as well. Um, and so with that, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank uh, all my collaborators. There's been an, a number of them. David Quigley is, our, uh, is a computational um, uh, biologist that trained in my laboratory, now has his own lab at UCSF. Eric Small is my uh, kind of key collaborator. Um, uh, Hanson, he gave us the localized prostate cancer samples. Uh, my colleagues at Blue Star Genomics helped, gave me access to their CLIA uh, uh, assay for 5-HMC. A number of collaborators have really pitched in and provided tissue samples over the years. A lot of this work is funded by uh, the Benioff Initiative for Prostate Cancer Research, which was a large philanthropic gift uh, given to UCSF. Um, I'd like to pause and take any questions from you guys. Fabulous. Thanks so much, uh, Felix. That was just a spectacular, spectacular talk. So I've got a few minutes for questions, appreciating that we did start a little late for technical reasons. Um, so if you want to ask a question, I think you um, like just put, put up your hand up on that hand up function. Uh, Mitch, go ahead. Mitch Lawrence, oh, there he is. Um, actually, Mark, I think I, I shared the link with some of my students in the lab, so that's one of them. Oh. I'll let them ask. They're, Mitch, we're all coming up as Mitchell Lawrence. There's oh, clients okay. of <laughs> uh, It's Luke, Luke Fury here, I had a question. Um, the, you went quickly over the, the data, or quickly for me. Uh, when you have gain of MIC um, copy numbers, <clears throat> is it do you see sometimes differences at five uh, HMC between the gain or when you have copy number gain, uh, every copy usually is gonna be transcriptionally active? Yeah, so uh, first of all, th thanks for joining this talk. It's good to hear from you. Um, and so you're correct that when you have copy number gain, uh, you have increased five HMC because of what you said. And so um, what I'm trying to say is that five HMC you can pick up copy number gain, you can pick up increased RNA expression, you can pick up increased RNA expression independent of copy number gain, but you can also pick up increased RNA expression if it occurred because of copy number gain. And so um, uh, you're right that MIC amplification okay. automatically has higher 5-HMC levels, but we've done genome-wide analyses showing that 5-HMC predicts a gene expression even beyond, uh, even when you account for copy number gain. Is that the question you were asking? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thanks. I've actually got a question, for Felix. So um, as, as you track CT, CTDNA, both in absolute quantity as well as the nature of um, um, different mutations over time. So is the typical response, so this is in the context of metastatic disease, that you see um, disappearance or substantial um, diminution of the um, um, amount of DNA, but then, uh, but then as as that increases, is that what's the what's the clonality usually like? So are the are the resistant do the resistant subclones basically just kind of completely dominate the? You kind of predict that they would. Do they completely dominate the um, the? I mean, do they substantially comprise? the total DNA, or do you still see maintained um, sort of subclonal heterogeneity as the amount of absolute DNA develops during resistance? Yeah, so Mark, we, uh, we actually haven't done serial samples of CT DNA from patients uh, over the function of treatment. We want to, um, we just haven't. It took us a while to kind of build our pipelines and then uh, to kind of do these big integrative analyses across different uh, uh, types of genomic and epigenomic sequencing. But the question you're asking is something that we're very much interested in looking at. We just haven't gotten to it yet. Because I guess the kind of, I mean, where it's kind of heading is thinking about how you might design adaptive clinical trials based on the nature of, you know, clonal versus subclonal emergence of resistance and the degree to which CTDNA could inform that, which I think is a pretty appealing possibility. Uh, yeah. 
Nick, you, you know, I, I, I would say that one thing is we can definitely pick out a small cell easily with this yeah. approach. Very, very, and you know, actually, unsupervised hierarchical clustering. That's where it comes out. It, it, it you know, it hasn't miscalled one yet, but um, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking to see how uh, things change as a function of AR directed therapy, and you know, hopefully, we'll have that data in a year or two. But we don't have it now. Nick Wong. Yeah, thanks, Felix, for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, the question I have is uh, in relation to your sample matrix. Um, I was wondering if you. Uh, can see similar things, you know, in terms of five uh, HMC and things like urine. Ah, uh, yeah, you know, uh, people have uh, proposed. Uh, people have asked me that. Um, we don't have urine samples from these patients, and, uh, and you know, and so we haven't looked. But my assumption is that you will be able to. It just comes down to how much. What's the dynamic range of five HMC in? you know, in those samples. I don't think anyone's done that, or maybe if they have, I haven't seen it, but it's, I think it'd be a great, something great to do, you know, for sure. If you have urine samples, you know, I think I'd be game to help you out. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, Stephen Fox. Oh, hi, Felix. Uh, lovely talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Have, have you done a, a head to head with, I suppose you'd call them conventional CTD and assays to see whether you're I suppose your assay is more sensitive, specific, whether it gives you additional information. Yeah, so we uh, did a head-to-head -head with Alex Wyatt's conventional ctDNA sequencing assay, which is a targeted panel um, uh, that's been uh, relatively robustly validated. And everything that he called uh, in terms of copy number gain or loss, we picked up with 5-HMC based on, I think, the point we brought up earlier we're able to pick up genes, again, that are not amplified or, or lost, but that have high RNA expression, like top 2 a EZH2. You know, you would think that his panel would be better at picking up mutations, like, you know, P53 mutations than us, but in, in general, um, you know, it turns out when there's a P53 mutation, oftentimes there's actually decreased P53 expression. And so that's why I think we picked that up. We haven't... Um, done, I, I think you would need to do this in a couple hundred samples, go head to head with outcomes and see what shows what. We, we haven't done that yet. What we have done is we've done conventional methylation sequencing, like what Grail and Garden do for their methylation, compared it to 5-HMC. And I can tell you that the signal from signal to noise ratio from 5-HMC is so much better. It's like, you know, log folds better than conventional 5-methyl uh, 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 cytosine sequencing. And that's the best I can I, I can tell you at this point. How do you define a cutoff? Um, because obviously you're, you're going to have a very presumably wide dynamic range. Yeah, and so what we do is we benchmark it against, you know, let's say we have 100 samples, we can benchmark it based on quartiles or whatever else. Um, until we sequence hundreds, we won't have the benchmarks, right? And so we have to basically do it relatively within the population we have. Right, so that'll be a, a sort of a, a movable feast to a certain degree. Yeah, I, I think what's going to happen is like if you look at RNA expression panels in um, in localized prostate cancer based on tumor samples, those benchmarks are established when you get to whatever hundreds uh, of cases. At that point in time, you can because this is a clear grade assay, set absolute thresholds, but we're just not there yet. Right now, we're on relative thresholds. And can I just ask a technical question? One last one, apologies. Um, how do you how do you measure your ctDNA with respect to wildlife wild type? I mean, um, to quantify that. Well, I'm sorry. Can you ask that question one more time? How do you quantify your ctDNA with respect to you know normal wild type in the background? You gave a correlation graph between ctDNA. So uh, what I, I, I what I didn't mention was that this blue star assay they do low pass whole genome. Uh, on it as well. And so that's how you can quantify the ctDNA. Right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One one final question from uh, Chenke Ma. I can't see Chenke's picture. I presume she's one of the Mitch Lawrence um, false, I, false ID people that's up there. Um, so the question is on the chat. It's a uh, nice talk, Felix. Would 5HMC, uh, mm -hmm. I think, can you, can, you, can you like read the question there? Yeah, I can see the question. Yeah, Thanks maybe you maybe maybe question. you just answer it straight up. <laughs> so so really great question. So the question is, does five HMC indicate the tissue of origin like five MC? The answer is yes. Uh, you know, so we just submitted a paper um, recently to Nature uh, Genetics where we um, show that if if you apply five HMC to metastatic samples, 
you pull out, you know, a small cell cluster, you pull a, actually a GI stromal tumor that actually correlates with a spink overexpressing uh, a cluster. Um, the, the, you know, all methylation profiling, as you probably know, whether it's 5MC or 5HMC, these epigenetic marks actually highlight lineage specificity, right? That's why prostate cancer specific genes have the greatest concordance in ctDNA versus tumor. So yeah, actually, I mean, you, you really actually, it's, it does a really nice job of pulling out um, kind of tissue of origin. This company, Blue Star, their major test that they're trying to uh, develop is a, a test for uh, cancers of unknown primaries, where you just basically run a blood assay and they've shown that they've developed a tissue map with 5-HMC that's ex actually really specific. They've published that in Nature Communications. Um, so the second question you had was, uh, would 5-HMC peak have an overlap with the 5-MC um, hypermethylated region? So um, remember that 5-HMC uh, is probably associated with hypomethylation of standard 5-MC. Um, there is some overlap, but you know when you look at 5-MC, uh, when, when you look at methylation in general, 95% uh, of methylation species are 5-MC and 5% are 5-HMC. Uh, and so that actually helps you out. So you don't have to, you, the diff, you, you can actually kind of, the overlap is not a major issue. Um, I, ho I hope I, uh, I answered that you know, to your satisfaction. I want to go um, on. Um, with, I mean, uh, there's actually still a few people on. Um, I'm happy for you to do one more question, then we can call it a day because you really need to. You, you must be due for a glass of Pinot now, I would imagine, this time of night over there. So. Yeah, you know, uh, I had a I had a full day of clinic, so Thursdays are a rough day for me. But um, uh, you know, it looks like Richard had a question. I wonder what fraction of progressing MCRPC you would be able to sequence. How many would meet the five nanogram input of CTA DNA? What is the minimum minimum, minimum tumor purity that is required? Uh, so a bunch of different questions. I, I, you know, in our experience, as long as the patient's PSA is not zero. So if you treat somebody with hormone therapy who's, you know, castrate sensitive and their PSA goes to undetectable, or uh, no ctDNA assay is going to work because there literally is no ctDNA uh, to detect. Um, but what we've shown is that in patients with M0 CRPC with a rising PSA, you can actually uh, uh, look at 5-HMC uh, pretty reasonable. You can pull out AR response signatures and so forth, um, and you can get five nanograms from that. You know, I, again, remember, you might have to draw two or three vials of blood, but you'll easily get there. Um, and what is the minimum tumor purity that's required? So the answer, again, is it depends. The more prostate cancer specific, or actually the more lineage specific uh, your, 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 your gene of interest is, the, the less tumor purity you need, right? And so there's no absolute answer with regard to that. Um, but, you know, for example, the reason why AR signaling works out so great is what else causes AR signaling that sheds DNA into the blood? And so for that, that's why you, you don't need very much at all. But, um, you know, it's still kind of early days for us. I think we might call it a day there. Um, a, to give you a rest, and B, because I'm scared of how much more Mitch Lawrence might proliferate on the screen. Um, so, Mitch, if you've got anyone's got any more questions, I'm sure Felix will be happy to answer kind of directly via some other means 